Good afternoon, Governor Kate Brown here. I'm going to turn it over to, the doc to Dr. Dana Harganani for a few comments. Thank you, Governor. Before we begin, I want to take the opportunity to talk about the logistics for today's press conference. As many of you know, the Oregon Health Authority recommends that when indoors with people who are not members of your household, that you should wear a face covering. However, today we are taking off our face coverings when speaking so that we can communicate with people who do not speak sign language and depend on seeing a speaker's mouth and lips. The speakers are nine feet apart. The ASL interpreters are seven feet from the speakers and 11 feet apart from each other. We have also recently upgraded the air filtration system in the building. Thank you, Dr. Go or Governor. <laughs> well, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us today. We're here to give an update on COVID-19 and the challenges facing our hospitals as cases continue to spike and hospitalizations rise. I'm joined, as you know, by Dr. Dana Harganani of the Oregon Health Authority and Dr. Renee Edwards, the Chief Medical Officer at Oregon Health Sciences University. On the phone, we are joined by Dr. Jeff Absalon, Chief Medical Officer at St. Charles Hospital, Dr. Jamie Grabowski, Chief Medical Officer at Asante, and Jennifer Burns, Chief Nursing Officer at Providence Southwest. We all know that COVID-19 cases are surging across Oregon. Over the weekend, we saw daily case rates near 1,000. And yesterday, I announced that nine Oregon counties will now be starting a two-week pause as of Wednesday on social activities to help us slow the spread of COVID-19. Our fears that this virus would spread out of control when the colder months set in are certainly becoming a frightening reality. I've said this before, but from the outset, our goal has been to save lives and avoid overwhelming our healthcare systems. When people become ill, we need to ensure that there are enough hospital beds, PPE, and staff to provide life-saving care. Today, I've brought together hospital leaders from across the state to give an update on where we're at with our hospital's capacity and how we're preparing to deal with a potential influx in hospitalizations. This is very serious. Oregon is headed on the wrong road. While we have plans in place to share beds and ventilators if necessary, that needs to be a last resort. We cannot and should not be relying on the fact that our hospital systems can withstand a surge, but instead we should be working together to ensure they don't have to. I need Oregonians to know it's not too late to do the right thing. Every action we individually take, from wearing a mask to staying home when you feel under the weather, to truly limiting your social interactions can really make a huge difference. Our fears that the virus um, can you, uh, make a huge difference. Your actions can save someone else's life. You may be spreading the disease and not know it. Truly, lives are at stake. I'm now gonna turn it over to Dr. Harganani to give an update on the COVID situation in Oregon and then we'll pass it over to our chief medical officers and nursing officers to share updates from their hospitals. But I do wanna close with this. Please don't forget your W's. Wear your face covering, watch your physical distance, wash your hands, and I'm gonna add another W. Please, please, please don't go to work when you are sick. And finally, get your flu shot. It'll make a huge difference for all of us. Dr. Harganani. Thank you, Governor Brown. Again, I'm Dr. Dana Harganani, the Chief Medical Officer for the Oregon Health Authority. I want to start today by thanking the hospital leaders that are with me today and also thanking hospitals across the state. 
And I especially want to thank the brave and heroic healthcare staff for all they have done during this crisis to help keep Oregonians health and safe. Every provider, support staff, and administrator around the state has been on the front lines of this pandemic every day since February, and we are all deeply appreciative of the efforts and sacrifices. Before going further, I want to mention where we are in, with COVID in Oregon. Today, we are reporting 771 new cases, bringing us to 51,909 total cases since February. We went from just under 40,000 cases three weeks ago to now nearly 52,000 today. I am deeply saddened to share that we have reported three new deaths today, taking the tally to 737 Oregonians lost to COVID-19. Meanwhile, for the week ending September, or excuse me, Sunday, November 8th, thousand one hundred and seventy seven new cases from the prior week and the week before there were three thousand four hundred and fifty two cases the trend is clear and very concerning and sadly the pace of deaths continued to march along with dozens of Oregonians lost each week finally while the number of tests reported in this last week will also be higher than it has been in recent weeks the percentage of positive tests does not look to have fallen significantly Connected to high case counts are hospitalizations. Hospitals are seeing an increase in the hospital census numbers due to COVID-19. We currently have 285 hospitalized patients with COVID positive tests in Oregon. We've seen a 57% increase in the past week since November 3rd in hospital census of patients who have been tested positive for COVID-19 and an 83% increase over the past four weeks since October 12th. We can also look at bed counts overall. In Oregon today, we currently have 146 available adult intensive care unit or ICU beds, 701 available adult beds that are not ICU beds, 130 beds for pediatric intensive care patients, and an additional 116 beds for pediatric non-ICU patients. When we look at hospitalized COVID patients by region in our state, we see that region one, which includes the Portland metro area, has seen a 57% increase in COVID-19 positive patients in the past week. Region two, the upper Willamette Valley, has seen a 36% increase. Region three, which is the lower Willamette Valley, plus Coos and Curry counties, has seen a 79% increase in the past week. And Region 5, comprised of Jackson and Josephine counties, have seen a 162% increase in COVID positive patients in the past week. Thankfully, we have more ventilator capacity than we did in the spring, and we feel confident about our understanding that there are 762 ventilators available in the state. In the state. This all brings me to our work in partnership with hospitals around the state to ensure that we're prepared for a continued surge in COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations. Since the H1N1 pandemic, we've been working closely with hospitals around the state to prepare, prepare for emergencies just like COVID-19. And while COVID-19 has been larger and longer lasting an event than we could have ever anticipated, we found that our foundational learning and planning has helped us be ready in the early days when we first saw these cases. That previous planning also provided a basis for a deeper relationship with our healthcare partners as we moved further into planning and preparedness for a new level of cases and hospitalizations. We now have in place multiple systems and plans that leave us much better prepared to handle high case counts and sick Oregonians. We are better prepared today than we were in February when we identified our first COVID-19 patient. Our regional approach to hospital preparedness and response remains the cornerstone for our planning. We work with our hospital partners across seven regions in Oregon to make sure that if one hospital is unable to meet demand, other regional uh, hospitals and partners can step in to assist. The basis of this arrangement is coordination, collaboration, and information sharing among hospitals at the region and state level. Capacity information at the regional, at the regional level flows up to the statewide level. 
we help to coordinate with hospitals across these regions to understand what needs exist as we assist our hospital partners as they ready for challenges they might face. A key feature of this system is the communication and coordination that allows patient admissions to be distributed within a region or across regions if capacity is strained. And in good news, the system was put to test during our wildfires this fall when we saw hospitals in close proximity to fires facing evacuation. The surrounding hospitals and the regional health system were able to uh, communicate, communicate coordinate and flex to meet that demand, and in short, the system worked. But there are limitations to what Oregon's healthcare system can handle. Even with regional planning and the hard work of all of our hospital partners, we cannot handle ever-growing high daily case counts and widespread hospitalizations. The system is flexible and has capacity, but only to a point. For this reason, you've heard state officials for months say that we need each individual in Oregon, uh, each individual Oregonian to take steps to limit the spread of this virus. We must keep a new surge in cases from overwhelming our system. We know we can rely on our health system, uh, our health care system and low, uh, hospitals to manage their bed space, to manage staffing and supplies as cases increase but they don't have infinite capacity. We need to rely on Oregonians to help us manage the virus by taking steps to limit spread. Oregonians are worn out, tired of a year with limited social connections and so many difficulties of all types. Our healthcare workers have felt this too, even as they continue to face the virus on a daily basis. They've done their jobs every day all the while working with us to plan for another race in cases. Let's repay our healthcare heroes by taking seriously the recommendations to stay physically distant, to always wear face coverings when you interact with anyone who lives outside of your household, and yes, to take the difficult steps of avoiding gatherings even as we enter this holiday season. Together we can manage to prevent a further surge that overwhelms our planning and puts us at risk. Thank you. Dr. Edwards. Thank you, Dr. Harganani, and also thank you, Governor Brown. I'm very pleased to be able to join everyone today. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Renee Edwards, and I serve as the Chief Medical Officer for OHSU Health, which also serves as the Regional Coordinating Hospital for Regions 1 and 6, which span from the Northern Oregon coast through the Portland metro area and along the Columbia River to the Dalles. Over the last nine months, Oregonians have made tremendous personal sacrifices to save lives and prevent hospitals and health systems from being overwhelmed with patients critically ill with COVID-19. And for that, we and all frontline healthcare workers who continue to step up every day and care for these patients are immensely grateful. Last spring, as COVID-19 came into our communities, we and health systems across the state developed individual plans for each hospital to ensure that we could effectively manage a large influx or surge of critically ill patients sick with COVID-19. We also worked together within regions to coordinate these plans between hospitals. We had hoped to never need these plans, but last week, in response to a record-breaking number of COVID-19 cases and a large increase in the number of critically ill patients requiring the highest level of medical and nursing care, we had to crack open those plans and in some hospitals implement them in one or more of our intensive care units for the first time. There's no question that we are at a crossroads and I'm here again today to ask for your help in flattening this rapidly developing COVID-19 curve to save lives and preserve hospital capacity. If we closely follow the safety measures that Governor Brown has put in place to pause activity and continue to adhere to all existing protective guidelines, we absolutely can change the current trajectory and stop the spread of coronavirus through Oregon. 
Together, hospitals and health systems across the state are committed to doing everything we can to care for all those who need us. Oregonians require care for many other conditions than just COVID, and we need to maintain the hospital capacity and healthcare workforce to address all of these needs in addition to COVID-19 patients. With the number of COVID cases that we've seen over the last few months, we've been able to balance our care for all. But with the currently rising numbers, we are at risk of no longer being able to maintain this balance. To that end, we continue to closely coordinate our efforts in partnership with county, state, and regional public health officials to ensure that we have adequate staffing, supplies, beds, ventilators, and other equipment. But we urgently need your help now. The COVID cases that we're seeing today have already locked in the hospitalizations that we'll see two weeks from now. As it takes about two weeks for patients who are infected today to become ill enough to require hospitalization if that is indeed going to be the trajectory of their disease course. By pausing now, we're trying to prevent these numbers from getting even bigger and impacting us farther down the line. To protect ourselves, our loved ones, colleagues, and our community from infection, and to protect our economy, it's critically important that we follow the governor's guidance and avoid social gatherings. Please stay home to the extent possible, and if you must go out, wear a mask, stay six feet away from others, and wash or sanitize your hands frequently. Please do not go to work if you are sick. It's also important to remind everyone that you could be infected with COVID-19 and unknowingly passing it on to others, especially in the two or three days before you even develop symptoms. For some people, symptoms may be so mild that you don't even realize you're infected with COVID-19. That's why wearing a mask, even when you don't feel sick, is so essential. Wearing a mask, keeping your distance from people may prevent the virus from infecting others without your knowledge, just by talking to someone close to you. I want to close by acknowledging, as Dr. Harganani did also, that everyone is exhausted, frustrated, and grieving by this historic pandemic. I extend my sincere condolences to everyone who has lost a loved one, friend, or colleague to this disease. And I also want to take a moment to recognize those who've lost a job or who are experiencing financial losses as COVID-19 has wreaked havoc on businesses and employers. In Oregon, we've endured a number of combinations of crises this year, but we can't let our guard down quite yet. Some of the world's brightest minds are working together to develop new medicines and a vaccine that will allow us to return to the activities we love. We got new information on this front just this week. So hope is in sight. But until then, to protect your health and safety, our hospital capacity and our economy, we strongly urge you to follow the guidelines set forward by the governor and our state and federal public health officials and pause or cancel any social gatherings. Thank you for your continued support. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. Good to have you back. Uh, we now have on the phone uh, Dr. Absalon. He's the chief medical officer at St. Charles Hospital in Central Oregon. Dr. Absalon. Thank you all for attending today. Uh, my name is Jeff Aspen. I'm the Chief Physician Executive for St. Charles. We have four hospitals in Central Oregon. Our largest hospital in Bend is the Resource Hospital for Region 7. Region 7 covers eight counties, all east of the Cascades, from Central Oregon down to the California border. We are also very concerned. We've seen a doubling in our inpatient cases over the course of the last week. Um, we are at our, we are at the same level as our highest amount of COVID inpatients earlier in the pandemic. And we recognize that we are just entering into flu season. And um, so we're, we're very concerned about what's happening here today and what we might see in the upcoming weeks. And again, ask for your help. Um, the holidays are upon us. It is cold in Central Oregon and we acknowledge that people are indoors. 
And all of these are factors that we think are, are important that are going to require increased attention. Um, I do want to share with you guys a little bit about what we're doing or what people might expect um, if, we, if we get to a place where we're becoming overwhelmed. We, as every hospital and health system in the state, have developed surge plans. And they start with um, rebalancing of patients between our facilities. Um, in other words, sending patients from Bend to our outlying hospitals um, or vice versa, which is what we're doing for all COVID-19 patients. And this, of course, has an impact on patients and families in terms of getting their care outside of their local community. Um, we do have a good amount of supplies in terms of extra beds and ventilators, but staffing is really an issue as we, as we um, bounce up against our, our capacity constraints. Um, we will have to reduce elective surgeries. Many of these are elective surgeries that people have delayed throughout this pandemic, but um, if our numbers get any higher, we will need to do that. Um, and additionally, if we hit a crisis point, we may need to shut down our elective surgeries altogether so that we can utilize the staff that work in our operating rooms and the supportive areas to take care of sick patients. And this is not what any of us wants to do. So again, we call on you to, to take action to prevent the spread of this disease. Um, we really do need your help. Uh, if you do your part to prevent the spread of this virus, you are directly helping our frontline healthcare workers. And many of these workers are balancing full-time work with parenting and teaching responsibilities in this current environment. We need them rested. We need them available to help you and all of those in need when care is necessary. Overwhelming our health system is not what any of us want. And I'll also add that the same actions that will prevent the spread of this disease to help our hospitals and healthcare workers um, may allow our kids to get back to work, back to school safely, which I know we all want. The last thing that I just want to share with everybody is that um, this is really an important message. We've learned a lot in this pandemic. One of the things that we learned early on was that people delayed care in the pandemic because um, they were fearful or were concerned about overwhelming our healthcare systems. We want to make sure people know, please do not delay care. Um, if you need to access our healthcare systems, they are safe. We have all worked hard to, to make sure that our environments are safe. They are. And if you need healthcare, please access care as necessary. So that's a part of the message we'd love to have you here as well. But again, just reinforcing what's already been said, Please wash your hands. Please keep your physical distance. Please wear your mask to protect those around you. And uh, we appreciate your time today. Thank you, Thanks, Governor. Thank you, Dr. Epsilon. Uh, next, uh, Dr. Jamie Grabowski, Chief Medical Officer at Asante in uh, Southern Oregon, Medford. Uh, thank you very much, Governor, and thank you to the press for this opportunity to address this really a uh, very important uh, question today and really to enlist your help to communicate to your readers and your listeners and your viewers about the importance of some of the key messages that we're getting out today. I'm Dr. Jamie Grabowski. I'm a family doc. I'm the chief medical officer at Asante Healthcare Systems. Um, we are headquartered in Medford. We're a three hospital system and uh, our largest facility, Rogue, acts as our regional facility um, during this outbreak. Uh, you heard earlier on that our region has really seen a logarithmic rise in cases, 162%, I believe was the number that was shared. And we've seen that, um, as you've heard, uh, in increased hospitalizations. We've seen over the last few days uh, threefold increase in the number of cases. In fact, uh, as I'm sitting here, uh, I see on our list that we just admitted another patient to one of our facilities. And so we don't for the short time see a slowing of that increase in hospitalized uh, patients. Um, we also see a challenge on discharging our patients as well. And so as the pandemic has spread locally, uh, skilled nursing facilities, intermediate care facilities, memory care, other places that act as discharge locations for an acute care uh, facility are really unable to accept patients, either because they have COVID in the facility or that there are staffing issues. 
and that really impacts our ability to care for the community in our capacity. For example, in uh, Medford, uh, Rogue had 15 uh, patients waiting for a placement. In our Grants Pass uh, area, Three Rivers, uh, there were 10 patients um, waiting for a placement. You know, Oregon has a legend of rugged individuality, but the reality is that this pandemic really requires a community and cooperative response to really address the root causes of what's driving this pandemic and really reverse that. It's not too late to continue to change and alter the trajectory of this pandemic. We've done it before. Any of you who have seen the, the curves and trajectories know that there's a rise and, and with a response comes that a trajectory bending. We've done it before and, and we can do it again. And really we need to get out those clear messages about utilizing masking in public, uh, limiting gatherings, even during uh, these important holiday seasons and assisting our local public health departments in contact tracing and those sorts of things to help us bend this curve. You know, the other day I had somebody ask me how I was holding up uh, during this uh, pandemic. And, you know, I responded, other than my residency training, I'd never worked harder um, in my career, but I've also never been prouder of the work I've, I've, I've been doing. And what I'd like to do is that right work. I'd like to make sure that we're preventing the spread of this illness and bending the curve. Sure, I can be doing work, looking and, and helping make sure we're, we're triaging appropriately and responding to an increasing pandemic, but I sure would rather be doing the work to make sure that we're uh, bending that curve and we're doing the kinds of things to prevent our citizens in Oregon from getting ill in the first place. So I ask you to help get that word out, help spread that word um, so that we can uh, be successful and give time for advanced therapeutic options and vaccination options that you've heard about to develop uh, so that we have a better ability to respond in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Grabowski. Next up, we have Jennifer Burns. She is the Chief Nursing Officer at Providence Southwest and uh, is in the metro area. Take it away, please. Thank you, Governor, colleagues and members of the press. I'm Jennifer Burroughs, a registered nurse, and I currently hold the responsibility for being Providence's Chief Clinical and Nursing Officer for, uh, for Oregon. I work closely with our nurses, physicians, and caregivers across the state. Providence is the state's largest health care provider with nearly 23,000 caregivers in Oregon and services from Columbia Gorge to the North Coast and south to Medford. I want to thank my colleagues and echo the points that they have already made. We are also seeing an uptick in COVID hospitalizations. We have gone from 34 inpatients to 58 in a seven-day period. We have just surpassed our highest inpatient number that we have had in any of our previous surges. We have planned for this. We're working hard together with our healthcare uh, systems and colleagues in all the areas that we uh, are in the state to care for the Oregonians and those communities. We do need everyone's help, however, to keep our hospitals available for the care of people in those communities. I am part of a larger Providence team that cares for communities across the western part of the United States. We have an active presence in seven states. We were the first healthcare system in the country to care for a patient with COVID-19. And since that time, we have leveraged our health system to innovate and participate in clinical trials, learn faster from each other on how to care for people stricken with this virus, and analyze our internal data to care for the communities we serve in. We have firsthand knowledge of the COVID-19 surges in Seattle, Southern California, and West Texas. That informs my view of where we are as a state today and how the decisions we make today as individuals impact our hospitals, emergency rooms, and physician offices in the weeks ahead. I know we are tired. We're all tired. I'm the mother of children in the Portland public school system being taught virtually. I'm the wife of a husband who has worked remotely since March. I am one of those people in the grocery store working harder to accomplish my weekly to-do list than I did a year ago. 
but I'm also a nurse and a voice for the professional clinical team that wants to be ready and able to effectively care for you if you need our services. We have witnessed the devastation that this illness can bring to people, families, and communities. We as the people of Providence want to be able to continue to care for people who have illnesses that are not COVID related. We need your help with this. We need you to make wise choices. Our nurses and frontline caregivers are our most precious resource in fighting this virus. They are our heroes. We need the public's health to keep them safe. As we enter into this holiday season, Providence wants all Oregonians to be of good health. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we're ready for questions. That was Jennifer Burroughs, Chief Clinical and Nursing Officer at Providence Southwest. Uh, we're going to start questions first with uh, Sarah Hurwitz at KPDB. Go ahead, Sarah. Sarah, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you so much. Um, I uh, had a question for any one of the medical uh, directors on hand. Uh, I'm curious if um, Oregon is being asked uh, to provide any kind of help to other states in our region. And if that is the case, what is the uh, threshold for our state in terms of how much can we help before we're going to need help ourselves when it uh, comes to hospital capacity? Dr. Harganani, would you like to take that one? I'll start and, and pass it um, off. Uh, Thank you for the question. Again, this is Dr. Dana Harganani, Chief Medical Officer for the Oregon Health Authority. We are receiving this question a lot. Um, I think first I just note, there, um, based on the way our state uh, communities are distributed, there is a natural uh, amount of uh, movement that happens with patients seeking care um, across our borders with our state partners. Um, right now, everything we know is that that is about normal stage. That type of normal patient movement across health systems, for example, over state borders is normal. We do know that other states are stressed, uh, and we also have been talking about today uh, the rising case counts here. So we're watching this closely. Um, Dr. Edwards, do you want to add to that? Thank you, Dr. Harganani. I would uh, definitely echo the comments that you've already made. The only addition that um, I would add in is that many of the large hospitals and health systems in, or in, o at, excuse me, in Oregon, uh, certainly including OHSU, serve not only as um, um, sites for the local communities um, and for the state, but also for the region. And as a result, we do receive in, on a regular basis, transfers from uh, other hospitals uh, that are in the Northwest region when we need to provide care for patients, particularly who have specialized healthcare needs. As Dr. Harganani mentioned, we really have not seen a change in that referral pattern at this time. Uh, the exception would be that for some highly specialized care, for example, something called ECMO, which is an um, external corporeal uh, way of supporting the heart and lungs um, in critically ill patients, there actually exists a regional network across Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and other states in the Northwest region that partner together for these highest level of critical care needs. So we do receive patients from other uh, states in that regard, but otherwise Otherwise, to this point in time, it has been typical referral patterns. Thank you, Sarah. We'll go next to Blake Allen and Bend. Go ahead, Blake. Uh, yeah, my question is for the governor. Is there any uh, possi uh, possibility that Deschutes County is being eyed for a possible pause, as is uh, like with other counties? Look. Um, I have put uh, nine counties uh, based on their uh, coronavirus infection rates on a two-week pause. Um, I am, we are at a crucial point in Oregon right now, and that's why we're here today. We're asking all Oregonians to redouble their efforts um, to slow the spread of the disease and reduce transmission. Um, I've obviously said the handful of ways that each one of us can make a difference. Um, but I would say at this point, given the surge that's happening across the entire world and across the United States, that all counties are at risk uh, for uh, additional uh, 
changes and further closures. And it, it, honestly, each one of us can make a difference and the citizens in Deschutes County can do their part and help slow the spread. All right, thank you. Thanks, Mike. We'll go next to Tim Gordon with KGW. Go ahead, Tim. Tim, are you there? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hello? Yes, go ahead, Tim. Yeah, I am. Come in. to uh, oh. Lachey Wesley with K2. Go ahead, Lachey. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I had a question about the emergency rooms. Um, how have emergency rooms been impacted? And my other question was for OHSU. I was wondering what specifically, what specific changes needed to be made last week in response to a rising number of hospitalizations. Thank you. Uh, this, this is Jamie Grabowski. I can take a, a bit of that first question from Asante's perspective. We have seen an increased volume in our emergency rooms. We are working uh, to make sure that we can manage that as appropriately as possible. Uh, we have set up regionally a COVID hotline. Uh, I heard today that we had 100 calls an hour into that COVID hotline for the first two hours of the day in preparation of this uh, talk. And what we do there is we, we have uh, a nurse who helps triage a patient to decide what the right level of care they need. Uh, do they need a, a virtual visit? Um, do they need an in-person visit in an urgent care that's safe for a patient with potential COVID symptoms? Or do they need to go to the emergency room? So we're helping regionally to make sure we're appropriately um, uh, triaging and providing the right resources to our community members. Do Dr. Absalon, do you wanna um, give an update from Central Oregon? Yeah, thank you, Governor. Um, we've been doing pretty well with regards to our emergency department. I, I think we, uh, we also have a hotline as Dr. Gaboski described for, for uh, Southern Oregon. And it's been serving the same type of a role. And so we've been working hard to direct people to get care in the appropriate location. Um, so, so far we're doing okay with this. Uh, we are, as I mentioned um, earlier, running towards flu season when, when we will expect to see increased volumes in our emergency department. But at this time we seem to be doing okay. HSU, thank you for the question um, that I referenced. As part of the um, preparation work that Dr. Harganani mentioned that all of the Oregon regional areas have completed, over the summer each region was asked to submit to the state a preparedness plan for their specific region. And so in regions one and six, we submitted a plan that looked at the capacity of our ICUs and what percentage of our hospitals within the region were at that threshold capacity. And when we reached that threshold capacity, two things would happen. One is that it would trigger what we call a regional huddle, meaning that any of the hospitals within the region can make a call to say, we need to pull together all the hospitals in the region into a phone call to discuss where we are with capacity and understand whether we may need to share some of our patient load with other hospitals in the state. So the first thing to note that happened last week is that in regions one and six, we began regularly meeting our ICU thresholds that we had submitted to the state. And as a result, we are now having almost daily regional huddle calls to discuss our hospital capacity, including our ICU capacity, and make sure that no one hospital is reaching a stress point with being able to manage their capacity. At OHSU in particular, we have four ICUs, and we created a plan that if we reached a critical number of COVID patients, we would place all of those COVID patients requiring ICU care in a single ICU and place the non-COVID patients in other ICUs, and we activated that plan last week. Thank you. Thanks, Lachey. Uh, we'll go next to Aaron Ross with OPB. Go ahead, Aaron. 
Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, could, um, very briefly, could you um, have someone spell both the names of Dr. Grabowski and Dr. Epsilon? Great, thank you, thank you. Yes, I do. Um, so it sounds like we're seeing cases rise at a rate that we did not necessarily expect them to rise, going, you know, doubling the number of patients in some hospitals, um, seeing a 168% in cases in other areas. Um, are we prepared, we're prepared for what we're seeing right now, but are we prepared for this type of increase to keep going if we keep having this logarithmic increase in cases? Uh, thank you for the question. I can start out. This is Dr. Harganani with the um, Oregon Health Authority. Um, I do believe that so much of the planning uh, that has been done by our hospital partners and with the state are really helping prepare us for what will come with future hospitalizations um, and COVID cases. But as I mentioned earlier, it's not infinite in its ability. And so I think, again, we'd um, go back to the critical message today that you all, individuals across Oregon, Oregon have the capability to help us reduce the surge and reduce the transmission to help with the hospital capacity and reduce the impact. Um, there's a lot of tools that our hospital partners have to manage capacity, so I'll pass it off to any of them who want to add from their perspective. Or if I could just give a follow-up, um, just so we're uh, we have the fourth highest rate calculated, the fourth highest um, RT in the country right now. Uh, so if Oregonians do not uh, step up their game and practice better social distancing, will we be able to handle that rate of increase? Look, here's the reality, and here's why we're here today. We're at a critical jun juncture for Oregon, and this is truly a wake-up call to all of my fellow Oregonians. I know you're all tired. I know you're exhausted. I know that you have made tremendous sacrifices um, to reduce the curve early on in this virus, and those uh, sacrifices are impacting our families, they're impacting our schools, and they're certainly impacting our businesses across the state. But the harsh reality is we, it is not too late. We can change the trajectory of this virus. Uh, each one of us taking actions by uh, washing our hands, watching our phys physical distance, uh, making sure that we're wearing masks, uh, staying home uh, if you are sick, and of course getting your flu shot. In addition, um, as we see from the uh, nine counties that are going on a two-week pause, um, limiting social gatherings is absolutely key. Uh, I've been saying that over and over again. I know that Dr. Seidlinger has as well and other folks from the Oregon Health Authority. Um, but we are asking Oregonians to limit your social gatherings to your own household or immediate family. We have got to keep these gatherings small. We know that these gatherings are the source of much of the spread throughout the state. So we're at a critical juncture. You can make a difference, please. We have had one of the lowest infection rates um, throughout this entire pandemic, one of the lowest infection rates in the entire country. Um, but as you just said, our cases are increasing rapidly. We can stop the spread. We can slow the transmission of the virus. Each one of us can make a difference. Someone on the phone want to address any of those questions as well? This is Jeff Aspelon from St. Charles. And, you know, I can just say um, that when the pandemic started, we all got together um, within our teams to build these surge plans. So I know we all have them in place. And they really do start with um, lower level impacts to, you know, if we have a, a really significant increase, um, changes that will be dramatic. Um, you know, we can put beds in waiting rooms. We can put beds in conference rooms. The staffing is going to be really the challenging part of this. And so none of us wants to go there. Um, we would much rather be able to take care of our communities with the resources that we use every day and people that are um, doing, doing this specific work on a regular basis. Um, but you should be rest assured we've all planned accordingly. It just would be incredibly difficult. So please help us in this endeavor. Yeah, this is Jamie Grabowski from Asante. You know, if there is such a thing as a silver lining to this pandemic, I will say the, I 
prior to the pandemic, I had had the opportunity to work with Dr. Harganani or, or Dr. Edwards and, and just a bit with Dr. Absalon. But, you know, we uh, now collaborate at least on a weekly basis um, to make sure we're, we're as prepared as possible and that we're uh, sharing ideas and coordinating and collaborating so that we're able to respond to the virus effectively. That wouldn't have happened uh, had not this pandemic occurred. And I think one of the other things that the governor's done that has been really helpful is to help regionalize the care uh, so that on a regional level, we can respond to the pandemic as appropriately as possible, which uh, didn't exist. Uh, prior to this time. So um, really tremendous changes in the degree that we've been able to work together has happened as a result of this pandemic. This is Jennifer Burroughs from Providence, Oregon. I would uh, I just add, um, I agree with everything that's been said at this point. I would just add, um, you know, kind of a call out that our resources are finite. Um, and so as we see an infection rate surge, there will be a, there will be a point where, um, where we don't have enough resource without really um, changing the way uh, that we stretch kind of the way that we would normally uh, take care of people. We are also seeing illness in our caregiver teams across the, across the state. And as the amount of illness grows in the communities, um, we are um, struggling with uh, with illness in our own um, in our own hospitals as well, and so that also has impact. Making sure that there's enough respiratory therapists to take care of patients, making sure there's enough nurses, ensuring that there's enough providers, and uh, and as the infection rate grows in the community and the spread grows in the community, um, there's also the potential. To be, uh, to be infecting people that we count on to take care of the people who are most stricken with illness as a result of this virus. Thank you, Jennifer. We'll go next. To this, this is Jamie Grabowski again. I'll, I'll just emphasize, you know, in a role like being a, a chief medical or chief nursing officer, you have a lot of choice in the work you do. You get to choose your direction. I think we as a, a state are, are at a, a point where we need to make a choice. Are we going to really engage in these efforts to bend the curve, or are we going to spend our resources and time and energy in, in other areas? You know, I would, I would strongly advocate for us to take the path where we choose to engage in, in masking and high and hygiene and uh, limiting social gatherings and getting a flu shot and those kinds of um, low-cost, high-benefit uh, interventions. Thank you. And we have time for just a couple more questions, so we'll go next to Lisa Balick with COIN. Go ahead, Lisa. Yes, hello. A uh, question for Dr. Harganani and Dr. Edwards. When you talk about the number of available beds, is there a point at which certain hospitals would not be able to accept non-COVID emergency patients, like those in a car accident, or having a heart attack, how realistic is that? And then what would happen? This is uh, Renee Edwards from OHSU. Thank you for that question. I think we are um, uh, back to the point that we will, we do, and we will continue to care for all the patients requiring our care. But as has been mentioned several times, first by Dr. Harganani, we have an infinite number of resources. When patients come into our emergency rooms, when they come into our hospitals and doctor's offices, we will deliver care and we will be there for you. But as Dr. Absalon mentions, if we start becoming overwhelmed, then pretty soon those beds are in the hallways or instead of in a room or the nursing staff that we need to utilize to care for patients rather than caring for two or three patients at a time are caring for five or six patients at a time. So I want to emphasize that this is not about your hospitals and healthcare systems being there for you and the healthcare workers who will be there to provide your care, but it's understanding that we only have so many resources and so we want to be able to be there still for the unfortunate things like the car accidents or the heart attacks. This is why we're asking for your help today. The other thing that I want to say is that we have to remember that when a person becomes infected with COVID, it does take up to two weeks before they start developing symptoms. 
We're here today asking for your help, and we know that Oregonians will respond because you have already done so beautifully so many times before. But don't dis get discouraged if you don't see the numbers start coming down right away because we know that it takes a little time to start seeing the impact of the actions that you're taking today have a real difference in the numbers that we see even a week or two or three from now. So hang in there, and even if we see the numbers still not quite going down yet, know that the actions you take today will have an impact on the numbers two weeks from now. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, we have time for just one more question, so we're going to go to Sarah Klein with the Associated Press. Go ahead, Sarah. Hi, yes. Um, as we approach flu season, and OHA has obviously put um, a focus on avoiding a pandemic, I am curious what the average flu season looks like in Oregon. How much do hospital, hospitalizations typically increase by during that time? Is there added staff, at, staff in the um, amount of deaths? Ganani, do you want to take that one? Sure. Thank you, Sarah. Um, really important question to call out um, on top of our focus today around COVID-19, the importance of uh, our entering the flu season and all of the same measures to reduce the transmission of COVID will also help us reduce the transmission of the flu. Again, also getting your flu shot will be critically important. Um, we do track this data on flu every season and very closely and are able to compare it to national data. I do not have that uh, memorized today. Um, we uh, welcome people to sign up for weekly notices to come about the, trans the trends that are happening in our state and we will be sure to get that data to you uh, looking at last, season, uh, last flu season and what we're seeing uh, today. It is certainly early. We're just seeing a handful of uh, flu cases in our state so far, um, but we're tracking it closely and we'll certainly get that information to you. Thanks so much, Sarah, and thanks to everyone, uh, our speakers, for joining us today. That's all the time we have for questions. So. Thank you all very much. Be safe out there.